that time. Coming on, here, let's go. Come grab yourself the most comfortable seat that's available. If you do not want to be on the video, go sit on this side. That's the media free zone. If you want to, don't care about the video, please sit on this side, which is the media non free zone. It's the media oppressed zone. Maybe this was the key. There's a button. Welcome to Sunday Assembly's 104th Assembly in San Diego. Yeah. 32nd Online Assembly. The humans here in the room, we like to call ourselves a room blurs because we still have people on Zoom sitting over there. Who are called? Zoom blurs. <laughs> And Jen is holding up the Zoomblers. We can wait. Hi. Oh, Zoomblers. Every assembly has a theme. Today's theme is roofless. And as Paul said, our media free zone is in the back, kind of behind Betsy with the camera. And we do have childcare in the room over that way on the right for children one and a half years and up. And we're going to go straight into our sing along with Paul. Don't worry, be happy. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. I'll try it one more time. Good morning, everybody. Now we're getting there. One more time. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Zoomlers. Well, here's a little song I wrote.
Paul and Jeff. So it's wonderful to see all the assembly. We are an inclusive secular community that meets once a month right here on the third Sunday of the month to generally celebrate life, the one life that we know that we have, and together we foster community. How do we do that? Well, we're, we meet here, and in between we do service projects, and we have social events, and we generally live up to our motto, live better, help often, and wonder more. And today, um, I, Kristen Smith, will be your MC, and also um, Lynn is going to be my co-MC, doing special parts. <laughs> And um, one of the things we do is share how we're doing with each other. So we have a Life Happens segment, and in the future, if you would like to do that, don't think of it as a huge deal. It's kind of like a Facebook status update. You can write on the little uh, cards when you come in. And so today we have from Babs, she just took a 12-day trip to visit friends and family in NorCal, and it was great, but she missed it back here, and she's glad to be back. Yeah. Terry, last month we got to hear about his brother, and now his brother is at 1,521 miles, and he has 570 left to go on the Appalachian Trail. Yeah. And from the uh, Wesley slash Record family, uh, that would be Alexis and Charles and Roland and Lelia. Um, we have been waiting a year to make our space more accessible, and our permit just got approved. Workers show up on Tuesday. This has been the plan for the last 10 years. Wow. And Sabina and Phil, who are with us by Zoom today, I believe, um, just returned from a cruise to Edinburgh, the um, Orkney Islands, the Shetland Islands, and Norway. Wow. <laughs> and Steve has had a lot of time on his hands during a break from work, and he was recently recognized as a top 12 volunteer for the San Diego Low Income Tax Prep Program. That's really cool. All right. And Jen, who is um, facilitating our Zoom, will come up here and tell us all about our current Help Happens Community Service Committee. Hey, good morning. So yesterday we had a beach cleanup at our adopted beach at South Shores. We picked up around 30 pounds of trash and recycling from the beach, not including a printer found by uh, Rachel and Steve who <laughs> dragged it back to a trash can. Uh, and our next cleanup will be on August 12th. The, there was actually a lot more trash on the beach than we have seen in recent cleanups. So, and with all the activity at the beach during the summer, I, uh, I'm guessing the August cleanup will be sorely needed. Uh, and then our next community service committee meeting is going to be on June 26th at 7 p.m. via Zoom. So look for that on the meetup and Facebook. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. And now we are going to have a reading, I Like to Think of Harriet Tubman, by Susan Griffin, read by Gracie Soden. On the eve of Juneteenth, uh, this poem was written in 1984, I Like to Think of Harriet Tubman, by Susan Griffin. I like to think of Harriet Tubman, Harriet Tubman who carried a revolver, who had a scar on her head from a rock thrown by a slave master because she talked back, and who had a ransom on her head of thousands of dollars, and who was never caught, and who had no use for the law when the law was wrong, who defied the law. I like to think of her. I like to think of her especially when I think of the problem of feeding children. The legal answer to the problem of feeding children is 10 free lunches every month, being equal to the child's real life of eating lunch every other day, Monday but not Tuesday. I like to think of the president and the law and the problem of feeding children. I like to think of Harriet Tubman and her revolver. And then sometimes I think of the president and the other men, men who practice the law, who revere the law, who make the law, who enforce the law, 
who live behind and operate through and feed themselves at the expense of the starving children because of the law. Men who sit in paneled offices and think about vacations and tell women, women whose care it is to feed children not to be hysterical. Not to be hysterical as in the word hysterikos, the Greek for womb suffering. Not to suffer in their wombs. Not to care. Not to bother the men because they want to think of other things. I do not want to take women seriously. I want them to take women seriously. I want them to think about Harry Tubman. And remember, remember she was beat by a white man and she lived. And she re lived to redress her grievances. And she lived in swamps. And she wore the clothes of a man bringing hundreds of fugitives from slavery and was never caught and led an army and won a battle and defied the laws because the laws were wrong. I want men to take us seriously. I'm tired of wanting them to think about right and wrong. I want them to fear. I want them to feel fear now as I have felt suffering in the womb. And I want them to know that there is always a time. There is always a time to make right what is wrong. There is always a time for retribution. And that time is beginning. Wow, that was powerful. So now we're going to have our speaker, Dr. Leslie Lewis. She's got a PhD and an MPH. She's a continuing lecturer in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at UC San Diego and Director of Education and Community Engagement at Homelessness Hub, a new research entity at UCSD that conducts applied research into the causes, complications, and consequences of homelessness. She's also the founder and director of the Community Hope Project, an all-volunteer-run nonprofit organization that works to foster peace, justice, health, well-being, and resilient, inclusive communities. She directs the Youth Scholar Activist Program, which unites high school students from San Diego with UCSD undergraduates for collaborative learning, critical analysis, and leadership development across local and international communities. And Dr. Lewis will be staying after the assembly to chant, to chat. So, please, not chant, chant, <laughs> talk, if you have questions. So please hold any questions until then. Thank you.
sort of just a... That's nice, but we, you know, we serve 16,000 or more in the case of Family Health Centers in San Diego, 27. question of like, did enough? that happen, was that a cause, or did that happen as a result yeah, of, or work. possibly both, right? Uh, next one. Um, okay, and so demographics, next one. Um, heterogeneous group, incredibly diverse group. I took, my students have um, interviewed yeah. a lot of people because what we do is we train them to help with research on particular projects, and we were, uh, we were uh, evaluating a safe parking program, so in, in that group, we had disproportionately high numbers of older adults. Seniors are actually the fastest growing subpopulation of uh, unhoused folks. Um, uh, upwards of 50% are, are 50 and older. Um, more than a quarter are 65 and older. And you know, I don't, you know, I'm not sure you could pick a subpopulation and which one is most uh, heartbreaking. Veterans, about 10%. Um, Across the country, it's a little over a third of, of people experiencing homelessness are members of families. In California, it's actually less because we have a disproportionately high number of the unsheltered folks, and so it's more adults. It's about 20% families. Um, as far as youth out on the streets, 40% are, are, are LGBTQ identifying. College students even, and this is always often a surprise to people because people think, oh, this is not a group that ever has any problem. 5% of uh, UC students are housing insecure. More than 10% of Cal State students uh, have experienced homelessness, and uh, about 20% of, of community college students. So it's, it's so bad that like many college, uh, community college districts will set aside, you know, they have been tasked with setting aside one of their parking lots so that people can live out of their cars while uh, attending classes. So. Um, and then, you know, as in all, thrown, all things across our society, um, you, you know, uh, structural racism, systemic racism plays a massive role. So we see disproportionately high numbers of people of color, in particular uh, black Americans, uh, Native Americans. Um, Pacific Islander is interesting. It's, it's really, our folks are really disproportionately represented. And so there are lots of, we could spend a whole lecture just talking about why that's the case, um, but it is the case and it's, it's egregious. Um, so as I said, one of the first things we teach the students is that there are all these structural causes of homelessness. This is, you know, largely, for really anything that's going on, we often have kind of an uh, individual um, sort of uh, determinant of whatever is going on, and, and the truth is that it has to do with our um, general economic insecurity that, you know, so many people are living just close to the bone in economic precarity. I, I, a couple of uh, metaphors that are really helpful, one is a cliff. We have so many people close to the cliff's edge, um, and what we need to be doing is moving people back and making them safer, and unfortunately, a lot of the services are like at the bottom of the cliff, right? Oh, okay, well, let's help this person who just fell. And another metaphor often used in public health is um, upstream, downstream. So we gotta go upstream and address the causes, because what we're doing is pulling people out of the water and saying, all right, let's see if we can find you a house in a, in a housing economy that is virtually impossible for people who are at, you know, at a particular uh, income level. 
Um, we've got economic insecurity, we've also economic inequality, which they, they play together, don't have time to go into, but if you're interested, I can talk about that. Um, a dearth of affordable housing, uh, we lack across the country more than seven million uh, how, you know, like housing units that are affordable to people at extremely low incomes. Um, and that's you know, exceptionally so in California. It's a surprise to people because we're such a progressive state in some ways. We're actually um, the state with the highest functional poverty level and we are the most unequal state because we have such incredible wealth and, and, and so many people who are struggling. Um, and grossly inadequate social supports, right? And we have this constant sort of debate about whether we just we just passed the whatever what was the, the ceiling, the debt ceiling thing, and we, you know, we put in we we collectively, not me. <laughs> I'm sure most people here didn't want these things, but but yeah. So we uh, we we make people suffer who are already suffering, and we blame them. It's pretty awful. So you got the sort of you know psychosocial harms that we do. Um, and this is just some, you know, some to underscore the point about our economic insecurity. There was a national survey that identified it was 69% of Americans have less than thousand dollars in savings. Yeah, this is stunning. And I think because most people say, oh, okay, most people are middle class, and then you have people over here who are struggling, and then you have the hyper rich over here. And it's a shock to find out just how many people are one paycheck, two paychecks, uh, maybe three paychecks away from being unhoused. And I really see it, and my students really see it when we talk with people at the safe parking. So at safe parking lots, you're talking with people who have lost their housing, but they still have their cars. Many of them are still working, they're in school, they're trying to make it, and they're just trying to, and they're trying not to fall deeper into homelessness. And I mean, they're like economic refugees, and so many older adults, and it's, you know, it's, uh, and you think about, there are these structural causes, and then what you have are these proximate causes. What tipped it, what tipped you over? And it's losing a parent. Like sometimes it'll be people in their 40s and 50s who left a job to come stay with their parent and take, take care of their parent, but when their parent passes, the housing goes away. Uh, whatever, whatever kind of housing it was, and so then they are just in grief and in shock because they don't have housing. 45% um, have zero savings, so pretty bad. Next slide. Um, the other thing is that we have seen massive increase in rental prices that has not gone, not been on par with uh, increases in income. And even when you look at this, this is slightly outdated. It, it continues like this. I mean, I think that increases just in San Diego, it's 20 to 30 percent increases over the last in rent over the last. Uh, two to three years, um, but even the 18% the rise in household incomes, that includes the massive increase that has accrued to the top one and really the top 0.1%. Um, because if you look at the, sort of the middle of the country, it's kind of flat line, and then you have increases in rent, healthcare costs, childcare costs, and so really what we have right now is uh, an economic situation in which it is inevitable that you will have people who are unhoused. Um, and yet we still are throwing kind of these, you know, blaming narratives at them. Next one. And this is just to give a sense of where you could uh, rent, um, I think this is for a two-bedroom, yeah, for a two-bedroom apartment. Um, this is actually an excellent website if you're interested to go to the National Low Income uh, Housing uh, Coalition. You can just put in your uh, zip code and find out what is the housing wage there. I put in mine because I live by the university, I rent also, and the housing wage there is uh, $56 an hour, which is why I spend 90% of my take home pay on my rent, and <laughs> it's just insane. Um, all right, next one. So, and so what happens to people? Um, you know, uh, it's, it's ex excoriatingly harmful to, to be unhoused for on so many reasons, and so we'll, we'll just talk about some. Um, oh, and I'm sorry, to, I should have put this earlier, but this is some of those kind of, um, in some ways, proximate causes, and as I said, in some ways can be uh, arise out of. So you have uh, a really high percentage of people who are unhoused have histories of trauma, I, I, you know, adverse childhood experiences, um, but then being out on the street, particularly people who are rough sleeping and not even in a car, um, you know, the, the, you're going to face trauma again and again. And that can be from a lot of sources. It can be from other people who are experiencing homelessness, but far more people are, you know, people are victimized by people who are housed or, uh, you know, sort of constant attacks by police. I was just having a text from a friend of mine. He now lives in a boat. He lived for 10 years. Um, next to a tree, he calls it Mad Dog Tree, and he just lets me know who of, of the people we know have been arrested, and been arrested, and know they can't get out, and they have dogs, and who's gonna take care of the dogs, and it's just a, so many crises. 
Um, but domestic violence is a, it's a large reason why many women, um, not only women, but disproportionately women, uh, fall into uh, homelessness. Being released from prison, where it's you know many times impossible to get housing. You're, you know, if you have a felony record, you can't in many states stay with your family if they receive subsidies. It's very hard to get a job. It's just difficult. Um, eviction is a huge cause. Uh, six million people a year evicted or houses foreclosed upon. Um, so lots of people fallen in, um, and it can be just a medical crisis, right? And, and bank, medical bankruptcy, and, or you lose a job, and, or you have that less than a thousand dollars, and your car breaks down, so you don't have enough to fix the car, so then you can't get to work, so you lose your job and you lose your house. It's just you know, it's just this tumble. Right, and um, yeah, and it's just, it is incredibly harmful, um, you know, to one's mental health, to one's physical health, there's all kinds of harms to child development, um, you know, the, the risk of, of kids dropping out of school skyrockets, and um, mortality rates for people experiencing, especially chronic homelessness, so chronic homelessness, I don't think I talked about that, but or about a third of the people experiencing homelessness uh, are chronically homeless, which means they've been unhoused for at least a year or multiple times, at least three times over, over a three-year period. Um, but your you know, mortality rates are increased by four to nine uh, times. Um, life expectancy in the U.S. is actually dropping because of COVID and overdoses and those kinds of things. We were at 78 years, last I checked, it might be down to 77, but for somebody who uh, is experiencing homelessness, 48 years. It's just stunning, yeah, lower than most places around the world. Next one. All right, a little uplift here. Let's talk about um, where we can think about, there's that little upstream, downstream model. A lot of our money goes downstream, and a lot of money goes downstream, and that is, uh, you know, what. what outreach workers, it's emergency shelters. In many ways, we have normalized this, and so we just have, there are fair critiques about there being kind of a homelessness industrial complex, because there are ways that we, you know, kind of adapt and get desensitized, and well, let's just keep doing this, but we, we need radical change upstream. Um, this is a 40-year-plus uh, crisis that we're experiencing, um, and, um, so if you think about what could we do upstream, um, you know, obviously we need to take care of the needs of people right now. People are hungry, they need shelter, we of course should do that. Um, but we also need to be thinking about how do we, number one, prevent people. So say you think about that cliff analogy, I'm interested in general prevention, which pushes everybody back, and that's like, um, how do we have a living wage? How do we have uh, far more housing that is decent, dignified, and affordable to many people? Uh, universal health care coverage, because that is a huge uh, cause, you know, universal child care coverage, things that can make people, you know, take a deep breath, right, so they're not constantly on the edge. But then there's like, how do you just hold back people who are about to fall? There are uh, shallow rental subsidy projects and pilots that are, you know, being attempted and studied. Um, there are ways that you can give cash assistance straight up, and those, of course, you know, the, the United States has a very... Uh, we're uncomfortable as a society and as a culture with the idea of giving people money because we think they're just going to be like grabby and they're just going to live high on the hog. And, and so we're, we really don't like to give it, but, but it is the most effective thing actually for the most part. Um, and uh, okay, let's see what else do I have here. Oh, no, yeah, that's good. We can, we can go to this. Just so if you think about people who, um, who have fallen into homelessness, um, Emergency shelters are good for some people. A lot of people don't like them. There's lots of reasons why. I mean, you can imagine places that you might want to go uh, if you're in a crisis, and it probably wouldn't be uh, a line of bunk beds where you don't know any of these people here. Um, you're maybe not treated the best by the staff, um, so you're perceiving, we're very social beings, we're very affected by how people are, you know, how are they perceiving us and speaking to us, and so maybe not the best. If I have any kind of disability, or maybe I'm older and have a hard time, and my only option is an upper bunk, well, I'm not gonna do that. With the increasing number of older adults, a lot of them need um, personal assistance, and they, and they will not let them into the shelter. So lots of reasons, so some alternatives. Um, actually, one of the places I took my students is called Seniors Landing, which is a new 
you know it, yeah. Um, a new non-congregate shelter option for um, older adults, and it's transitional shelter, meaning that, okay, they have permanent housing, but it's just not ready to go yet, so it's a place where they can be. It's, a, it's actually used to be a, a motel, and so they have their own room, they have meals, they have case management, they have their own bathroom, which is like the thing that people talk about, to be able to shower and just, it makes you feel human again. Um, the safe parking programs, as I, as I said, and we've looked at those. Safe camping, I don't know if you're paying attention to the news, but yes, we're going to be having a, a, a couple of those open up. Um, and in other places, Portland has, uh, has modeled this kind of tiny pod villages. And then maybe the next one, I think, had the, yeah, there's these Conestoga huts is another model. Um, this one, I think, also was in Oregon. Um, but the idea that you could have just, again, a place where people can put their things, uh, have a key, have some privacy. Um, this one doesn't even have a bathroom. You would have to have a shared bathroom, but this is, you know, a million light years. Um, I took my students to two of the safe parking lots. One is just people in their cars and you have a porta potty and these kinds of things. But there's a new lot that, this is Jewish Family Service of San Diego, they've opened up and they got some old uh, FEMA trailers. And just what, the transformation, because we talked with the same people who had been here and they were all families, women with, with kids. And to, to be able to lay flat, to know that your children are safe, you can, the, the, the mothers are finally able to sleep, that they can take a shower, yeah, incredible. Next one. Um, and uh, Housing First is the name of a general policy, which is a reaction to what used to be the case, which was, uh, okay, most of these people are substance abusing and they're, they have mental health issues and they gotta take care of those things before we can put them into housing. And the shift has been, no, duh, we need to put people in housing first and then they can address those kinds of things. So um, there are, you know, we're actually a housing first oriented city too, but uh, Texas has got some interesting um, models of like tiny villages. And the next one, and there's actually one that call themselves community first because it is, it's housing, these little wonderful tiny houses, but it's also recognizing that human beings need community, we need purpose, we, there's all kinds of things that really make life worth living. Um, the next one, um, yeah, so there are three P's, are place, people, and purpose, and that's, um, they are a faith-based one, I think I see a cross in there, but it can, you know, it doesn't have to be, it can be. Um, so, uh, talking a little bit again about those uh, upstream kinds of things that we could change, a living wage, universal health care, I mentioned those cooperative models of business, I don't know if people have heard of, but there's the Evergreen Cooperative, uh, uh, gosh, it's a whole, uh, bunch of different, like they've got the um, solar uh, panel, uh, in, uh, what do you call them, installation, they've got a laundry business, they've got um, an entire greenhouse farm thing, oh is that five more minutes, thank you, um, but it, the whole model is that workers are owners, and um, in uh, Jackson, Mississippi, they have something called Cooperation Jackson, and I think models like that, which shift from we have a very extractive, exploitative model of, of economic, you know, pro progress, right? And one where everybody could benefit, everybody puts in and everybody gets out could be really powerful. Um, but also, you know, changes to our educational policy, housing policy, tax policy that's more leveling. Uh, people don't realize, but um, we spend about four times as much on people with much more money than we do people who we often think of, the people who are getting vouchers. Etc. Um, we actually spend far more as a society or government with tax subsidies and stuff like that on people who have uh, housing um, and are, you know, a lot of housing, like wealthy folks. Um, and so in other words, we're not putting money where it's most needed. We kind of just sort of reproduce the, the, the wealth and equities that we have. Um, just uh, so in terms of legislation, there is um, something called the People's Housing Platform. It's seven separate bills, um, you know, brought up by, I forget what they're called, you know, AOC and Rep. Omar and, and Talib and Presley. The squad. And the squad, thank you. Brought up by the squad. Lord, they're awesome. But, you know, putting money into uh, rebuilding because we have really... Uh, uh, over the past decades uh, retreated from supporting uh, building and, and maintaining the infrastructure of public housing, um, whereas other countries, like you look to Germany, Austria, Singapore, a lot of different countries have, um, are doing a much better job of housing their people. Um, they call it social housing, we call it public housing, and we have the stigma that's attached to it, but we need to take that away because you know, build beautiful housing and, and make it affordable for people. Um, so they want to fund that. Um, 
community land trusts, because one of the reasons that housing is so expensive is the land underneath. So if the land is commuted, you know, is loaned, owned by the, the communities um, or a nonprofit that is committed to keeping it low, that's a good model. Um, and just a sense of numbers. Uh, there have been, I just saw a recent article, and there were a couple of nonprofits that calculated what it would cost to uh, fix homelessness or address homelessness in a serious way in California. And it was something like a little over $8 billion a year for the next 12 years. And then it would be something like $4.5 billion going, which sounds like a lot. And that this is just a breakdown of what it would be if we just gave rental assistance. So uh, perhaps you've heard of Section 8 vouchers and those kinds of things. Right now, from uh, one in four to one in five people who need that get it. And so it's already not going to enough people. So if we just gave that to the people who are struggling the most, that would be about 22 and a half billion. And just to give a sense of what we spend 22 and a half billion on, you know, like Christmas decorations. Um, you think also about our entire, so HUD, the Housing and Urban Development, uh, they, I forget what their budget is, 40 something billion. It gives 3.2 billion to all of the, you know, outreach and, and um, shelters, and so that goes out to different continuum of care. And then what we spend on our military, 877 billion. So it just dwarfs it um, one more. So, um, so what can we do? Um, I always think about, you know, I, that we can be operating at multiple levels at once. Just how we move in the world can have an impact. I mean, I see it with my students, like as they have learned things and talked with people and seen that these are just people like me, wow, she reminds me of my Aunt Lisa, all of those kinds of things. They're having conversations with their housemates, their family members, people. Even the research itself can be transformative. But so you all, we all can have an impact just in talking with people and changing some of the, the narratives. Um, but then also you can sort of get out there and help, and that is itself, you know, very healing for the people you're working with and for you. I mean, there's some great organizations like Think Dignity. Um, you know, there's, uh, I have to think about, but there's lots of work that you could sort of do as a, as a group or seek it out as an individual um, that I would, I would recommend. I think that's it. I think that's it. Yes. On time. Remind folks that she will be here after assembly for um, questions, and now we'll go to Paul for what it's worth by Stephen Stills. For what it's worth. It's a, it's a familiar old friendly song for me. I've been doing this thing since it came out last year. Um, <laughs> this, I couldn't possibly be that old. A lot of people think this was a song, of, uh, a Vietnam protest song. It was actually originally written, uh, there was a nightclub in Hollywood called Pandora's Box back in the 60s. It was super popular. Lots and lots of people would go there and there would always be a crowd outside waiting to get in. So the uh, Hollywood police decided they were going to shut it down. And uh, all the folks that loved going there couldn't see any reason for shutting it down and <coughs> turned into a thing. Pretty nasty thing. There's something happening here. What it is ain't exactly.
Lynn Warner, and I am the rare MC address giver. Um, and if you don't know, I'm a clinical psychologist, so I always sort of think like a psychologist when I'm doing these talks. So the theme for today's assembly is ruthless. Being ruthless or homeless or unhoused, these are tragic conditions. And I found choosing an MC address topic to be a major challenge. How do you speak on these themes and issues in a way that won't simply be depressing? Um, and so I struggled. It was only <coughs> yesterday, actually, that I settled, or at least sort of settled, on what I'd like to say. And then this morning, that, of course, got revised further. Um, I spent many hours over the last few weeks considering different approaches, uh, things that I might talk about today. Yeah. I even asked Gracie, our most expert MC, to share her thoughts on what she might talk about if she was MCing. And then I asked Alexis for some feedback on two different outlines I had developed, because she's another one of our regular and excellent MCs. But even now, after all of that, I feel a little bit uncertain about whether what I choose to say will be meaningful for those listening and not too depressing. Um, I'm going to summarize some of the ideas I considered presenting today, just to make the talk a little longer, <laughs> and, and to let you know that I really did think about this. One possible approach was to focus on what most of us here today have to be thankful for. A solid roof over our heads, a place to call home, and all of that entails. The field of positive psychology tells us that having gratitude about one's life situations improves our mood and our overall mental health. So an MC address about gratitude was a possibility. A second approach that came to mind was to share slides and photos I had taken in my neighborhood of some of the people living without housing, being sure to protect their anonymity. I was going to make the point that we all see such images around San Diego and how those realities affect our thoughts and moods day to day as we see them. Then I thought maybe I didn't need any actual slides. I could just describe some of what I see on a regular basis and encourage you to think about what you see, and encourage you to think about how those sites impact you. A third idea I had was to share a dream I had on Friday morning. It was a classic stress dream. I was attending the second class rather than the first meeting of a graduate course I was taking. And I had not purchased the text for the class, and I had not read the material we were going to be discussing. But the dream then shifted in the ways dreams do. It took on a very dark theme that included an older teen or young man having stabbed someone to death. And for some reason, he then sent me a letter that came in a folder, and a knife was sticking into the folder. And then he appeared in the classroom. I tried to respond to him with some degree of compassion and empathy and, and help, to help him feel calm and to help him feel seen. Later the scene and the dream shifted again and this young man and I, as well as a few of my classmates of color, were surrounded by an angry group of people. They were yelling racial slurs and spewing hatred towards us. And then I woke up. I think I didn't want that dream to continue. After awakening, I suspected this dream reflected my worry about not having decided what I would say today as your MC. But more significantly, I think the dream reflected some of the issues those who are unhoused deal with on a frequent basis. Dangers, violence, discrimination based on other people's stereotyped perceptions of those living on the streets racism, and all of its hateful expressions. But, instead of going into more details about this dream and focusing on its themes, yesterday I decided I wanted to talk about the losses experienced by those who live in various outdoor spaces in our communities. I hope that thinking about their losses may increase our compassion for our unhoused neighbors. 
In addition to whatever traumatic events may have happened in their prior lives, prior to becoming homeless, the people who live outdoors in our communities live with multiple losses. They no longer have things that most of us take totally for granted. For example, there are the obvious losses. No sturdy roof over their heads to protect them from the elements. No sturdy walls to separate them from others as they sleep. No bathroom with a toilet, sink, and shower. How would you feel if you couldn't easily find indoor plumbing for toileting, washing your hands, and bathing? People living on our streets and in our canyons and other places have no safe place to store their clothing or other belongings. They have no place to refrigerate or store food. They have no bed or sofa to sleep on. They have no ready supply of food and, and clean drinking water. And they have poor access to health come. All of those are losses. Things that they once probably had, just as most of us have them in our lives. But they're also less obvious or more abstract losses. And these are the things we may not have thought about or tried to imagine. Think about these losses in contrast to your daily life and what you have. There's this loss of safety 24-7. I mean, imagine what it is like to live without any sense of safety. Most of us don't have to consider that. There's loss of predictability. Most of us live in stable places and we have stable routines. Those who are living without homes don't know where they'll be allowed to rest or live tomorrow or next week. Will their makeshift housing and possessions even be there tomorrow or next week? There's a loss of normal routines for people who are, go from being housed to unhoused. What would it be like to not know where you'll be day to day and not have any schedule for work or school or meals or any part of your day? This may not apply to everybody who's living on the streets, but it applies to a lot of them. Imagine being too hot or too cold or wet when it rains that loss of just basic physical protection. Think about the loss of connection to family, friends, co-workers, and society at large that happens when someone becomes homeless. While they may form new relationships, they will have lost those they had before they lost their housing, perhaps lost their job, or were asked to leave by their family or aged out of the foster care system. Consider how someone may have a loss or change of identity, particularly if they have lost a job or career or family. Who are they now? Do they have any sense of purpose? Which Dr. Lewis mentioned in her talk. People may have a repeated loss of their possessions if you don't have a permanent residence, you often find that what few possessions you may have with you are confiscated or discarded by the police or stolen. There's no place safe to leave them. Sometimes loss of freedom is one of the results. As people who are living on the streets or our other open spaces, are arrested for all kinds of offenses, some small, some serious, but they lose their freedom. Can you imagine what it would feel like to experience all of those losses on top of the stresses associated with a lack of housing? Can you imagine the impact of such losses immediately after they occur, months after they occur, or for some people, years after they occur, still living unhoused. 
The collective impact of all the traumas from their early lives, the traumatic losses associated with their entry into the homeless community, the severe stresses and burdens of living unhoused, and the untreated physical and mental illnesses and substance issues, issues so many have, leave many desperate and hopeless and likely to die much younger than they should. It's actually a testament to their inner strength that people can survive for years under these conditions. For many of us fortunate enough not to be unhoused, it's hard to imagine enduring what they must, particularly for extended periods of time. Imagining all these challenges and losses should increase our compassion. So reflect on these things rather than actively trying to avoid such realities might find your gratitude is growing as a bonus. We must do what we can as individuals, and we must push our governing bodies to take bolder actions. We cannot just look away. Please consider donating your ideas, your time, your dollars, or specific items that you can afford to give to help our unhoused neighbors through the efforts that Sunday Assembly San Diego takes on, as well as through other nonprofit organizations, and even just individually. Every little bit helps. And now for a moment of, of reflection. Thank you, Len, for a very thoughtful um, reflection on, on all of these issues. So we're going to switch gears to some events that are coming up. And I, I'll also, um, I don't know if, uh, I don't think we have that, that some of the particular help happens, but um, I was gratified to meet that Betsy had recently taken dinner to one of the safe car parks. I would just say thank you for doing that. <laughs> so, um, so let's see. Our first event that we'll talk about is Summer Solstice in the Park. So that is coming up next Saturday. Next Saturday, right? Yes. We've got the date right there. June 24th. From 12 to 3.30. It's at Mission Bay, Vacation Isle. And we're going to have lots of uh, games and activities. We welcome you to bring some of those games and activities and it's a picnic picnic potluck in the park. Try to say that. Picnic potluck in the park. Alright. <laughs> From 12 to 3 30. And um, another week and a half after that we've got fireworks and hangout right here, right out there on the patio. And that event starts at 6 and goes to 9 30. Um, you can come in anytime up to about 8.45. The fireworks themselves start right at 9, and we'll have everybody out there on the patio to watch. It's a really great view, and have really great parking right here. And we share the space with um, the people who usually have this space. Um, and so it's a really neat event. Um, all right. And now, and oh, you heard it here first. Sign up on Meetup right away because we have a limit because we are sharing the space of 50 people. And so sign up now. All right. And now we'll go to Alexis for Pride. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so we are doing our very first in-person Pride March since the pandemic. 
The last time we were marching in the parade was uh, in 2019. This year's theme is Thrive, and we've decided as a committee to do it all about plants. So we're going to grow community. We're going to come, if you have decorations that are plant themed, or if you are willing to cut some of Betsy's ivy out of her backyard, we're going to be decorating with that. We're going to be handing out seed packets, and we need marchers, people to actually walk with us. After the parade and those that whole weekend, Saturday and Sunday, we're also having a presence at the festival. And Jen handed me, we still need to fill two slots. Uh, if we could get people Saturday night and Sunday morning. Now, the problem with Sunday morning is we also want you at our assembly, which is Sunday morning. <laughs> We're going to have a great time, it's going to be a great assembly, but if you are thinking, I really need to be at this festival, we're going to have a skeleton crew presence Sunday morning at the festival as well. We are splitting the team, so let us know what you want to do. After assembly, while we're going through the books and great games, our pride committee is going to meet for just five minutes to go over last minute things. Or if you want to join us, you can jump in and say, hey, where do I sign up? What do I do? And we'll just get it all settled. And we do need more marchers. So it's July 15th because San Diego doesn't do pride month in pride month. <laughs> Today, right now, when we finish up, out on the patio, there are books, games, puzzles, a few toys, a few videos. They're all for your taking. Um, we call this a slot. We encourage people to bring things that they are finished with and pick up things to take home. You do not have to have donated to take something home. Um, so feel free to check that out. Also, we've got additional swag over on our table most of which is free, so check that out too. Are you All right, I think Gracie's going to come up in a second. But before that, let's wave to the Azumblers. Jen's got our Azumblers right here. Hi! <laughs> Zoomblers, here's our Azumblers. Gracie, you're going to tell us about the North County Assembly. Special, special. We have a very special thing happening on July 30, 31st. <laughs> yeah, um, it's July 30th, and uh, that is uh, the fifth Sunday of the month. Uh, so uh, this will be a way of remembering our North County. So it's one of our presidents in North County. We have a building up there, um, Reverend Madison Shockley III, who uh, spoke here uh, last year, has offered us his space, and after much deliberation, uh, and uh, much vetting of the facility. Uh, we'd love to have so many of you come up there for this assembly. Uh, there'll be some of uh, his congregation will be there. Um, but uh, it's a beautiful facility. It's super friendly and uh, welcoming. And uh, we'd like to give this a shot and we'd like to be successful. So the more people are there, the better. And thank you so much. We hope to see you there July 30th. things I am supposed to say verbatim here. We are always on the lookout for excellent speakers and topics and events to host, and also cool stuff that you can come up here and do a show and tell about, so please volunteer for that. So if you have any input, just talk to anybody that you saw up here on stage today, and we're all volunteers, and we're dependent on your donations to keep this whole thing going. So we'd love for you to consider a donation into one of the jars that are on the tables, or you can use the handy dandy QR codes, which are in your program, uh, to set up a monthly recurring donation. As the finance chair, I can tell you that's really helpful because that helps us with planning, even if it's you know just five bucks a month or whatever, or whatever is good for you, um, or one time. And that helps us to budget. And if, this is also for a if you would like to donate some Sphinx eggs, or magical amulets, we will use our black market contacts to facilitate that. But we won't be able to give you a tax deduction letter for those. That uh, is a um, special message from might be able to guess. Um, now we're going to go into our next sing-along. 
Cat with Paul, California Dreamin'. Our last and final sing along. By the way, the North County event is at 10 o'clock, not 11. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you gotta get really early, like nine o'clock. It's really rough. <laughs> um, and speaking of which, there are a number of people who show up here around uh, eight thirty on Sunday assembly mornings to set up all the stuff and put out the coffee and set up the AV system and all this stuff. And we will have a very, very skeleton crew next to month and if you feel like you want to do something, you don't have to know how. <laughs> Even the, the tech stuff, I will say, take this cord, plug it in there and there, and you'll do that. And that would be great, and when it's all done, I'd say wind up the cord and put it in the bin. It, it, but it, it really, really would be helpful if anybody wants to show up and help us with that, because that's what we do. You know, that's, that's living better. <laughs> Okay, this song we're going to stand up and sing if you feel like it. And uh, as you know, the, those of you who know this song, uh, there's that echo part where everybody sings the other part. So search your souls, your hearts, whatever. Figure out if you should be doing the echo or the lead, and then just do that. You know, sometimes I split the room or, you know, but, but these guys are, you know, taking advantage of you guys. Uh, we're not going to do that to our, our media folks. So, anyway, we're just going to sing this and you're going to echo or you're not going to echo. And what the heck?